had to be taken. I think it was Friday. And uh, please remember our shut-ins, uh, Tom and Joyce Stidham, David Marshall. Uh, we're, we're glad that Ronnie's been able to be here last few <coughs> Sundays, so I don't know if he, he want to consider him shut-in or not. But anyhow, we're glad to see Ronnie here. Uh, also, Diane Shelby, and has been mentioned, Jim Hamm, Nell Pewitt, Clyde and Sue Bowen, and Bobby Stevenson. Please remember to pray for all of our shut-ins and those that minister to their needs, because that is a very, uh, very good, very tough job. Uh, we extend our sympathy to the Arlie Levitt family on his passing this morning. And, uh, of course, services are pending but uh, let's remember Arlene and her sister and the rest of the family at this time. If you have anyone on the prayer list or have placed them on the prayer list in the past, please remember to check that. They may have gotten well, hopefully. Uh, so update that. Uh, there's a sheet in the foyer to update the prayer list, so please do so. We have a new phone number for services, and the information on that is in the bulletin on how to access that if you are at home or can't be here. We have a secret sister reveal on April 22nd, and more details are to come on that. Also, the Tennessee Children's Home Food Drive uh, is underway, and the list is on the table in the foyer on items needed for that. There will be a spring get-together and egg hunt next Saturday, April 8th, from 2 to 4. We will have finger foods and crafts for the kids. Potluck for April has been pushed forward, uh, pushed ahead. Uh, it will be April 16th, that's the third Sunday, after morning services. So remember... Potluck is not next Sunday, but the next Sunday, April 16th. Please check your mailbox for mail. This concludes the announcements. Let's begin our worship as Nathan leads us in singing. Before our opening prayer, we'll sing number 59, 5, 9. Five, nine. <coughs> Come, let us all unite to sing the
Would you pray with me, please? Righteous and holy Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace at this time, thanking you for all the blessings that you've given to us. And it is because of your grace and your mercy that we can approach you in prayer. And Father, we confess that we oftentimes thwart your purposes for our lives. We do and say things that when we reflect upon them later, we wish we had done differently. In these times, Father, and for these things, we ask that you forgive us and help us to do better. And we ask for your forgiveness and that you help us to repent of those things. We thank you so much for your word, for the light that it sheds on our path, for the mercy and the grace that we see in the life of your son. We thank you for our health, for our strength, and we realize it is because of your abundant mercies that each and every one of us here this morning enjoys the measure of health that we do. We thank you for that. And we remember that there are so many of our number that have medical procedures that they're going to be going through. We pray that you bless the doctors as they oversee their care, be with the nurses who attend to them, and for those that we've lost recently, we pray that you would comfort their families, help us to be a comfort to them and help in any way that we can. And especially with the storms that came through <coughs> on Friday night, if there's any way that we can help in the community, we ask that you would help us to do that. Thank you so much for Jesus and it's in his name that we pray. Before we take the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 283, 283. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now born of all. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah. Almighty God, we bow before thee, offering our prayer of praise and thanks to thee for the remarkable gift of your son who came and lived on this earth and died on the cross, was crucified for our sins. We now partake of his bread in remembrance of that, of his sacrifice for us and his body that was given for us. In his name we pray, amen.
bow. Now, Almighty Father, we give thanks to thee for this cup, the fruit of the vine which represents Christ's blood that was shed on the cross, the blood that washes away our sins when we obey the gospel. Father, we're so thankful for this sacrifice that gives us hope of eternal life. Help us to always partake of this in a humble manner, well pleasing to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we give back a portion of our earnings, we'll sing the first verse of 508. 508. <coughs> Let every heart rejoice and sing. Let poor wool and thumbs rise. The aged men and children bring to God your sacrifice. For he Almighty God, we're, we bow before thee at this time, giving thanks for the opportunity and the privilege to be a part of the work of the church and, and giving funds to help further the work. And thankful that you bless us with the ability to do so and pray that these funds be used to glorify your name in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Our song before the lesson of the hour is 166, 166. Miss Gamini, would you please stand? 166. Oh, worship the King of glory. Oh, okay. what time? 
song after the lesson is 486. 486. It's good to see you this morning, and we are glad for those that are visiting with us. I want to remind uh, everyone that if you need any kind of hearing assist, we do have those now right outside these main doors to your left uh, that you are welcome to use if that is something that would be helpful to you during the worship service. 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 3. Our text this morning says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? It should be no shock to any child of God that the only way that you and I are going to overcome the world that we're living in today is through Jesus Christ. Shouldn't be any surprise, but a lot of folks, a lot of Christians, don't live their life with that in view. So how do we handle the tough times that we go through? How do we handle the disappointments that we face? How do we handle the losses in our life that we experience day in and day out? We all agree that we're living in a, in a time and in a world that <clears throat> it's more important to be socially and politically correct than it is to be scripturally correct. So how do we deal with it? Well, we deal with it the same way that Job dealt with it. We deal with tough times the way that Job suffered through tough times. I've never met anyone that had a day like Job. I've never met anyone that had the losses like Job. But we know that he never abandoned God. He never accused God. He never charged God with it. And that's why I think when we ask the question, how do I deal with tough times? This is one of the greatest areas to go to. But the Bible in general tells us how we deal with it. Sometimes we get so comfortable with the world that we're living in today that we don't want to leave it. But the fact is, ready or not, we're going to leave it. Prepared or unprepared, we're going to leave it. We're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, but we're going to leave it. And so when we look at the story of Job, when we see some of the lessons, and just eight of them real briefly this morning, where Job never charged God falsely. He said, I came into this world naked. I'll go out the same way. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and in all this Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. Isn't that the key to handling tough times? So many today point to God for anything negative. Anything negative that happens, it must be God. Anything negative, it's an act of God. Anything negative, but when we have beautiful days, when we have a wonderful life, are we blessing God? Are we thanking God? The world certainly doesn't. As I said, the world calls things that are tragedy acts of God, but yet the beauty, the sunshine, the beauty that we have season after season, day after day, never going to hear the world say, well, it's another beautiful act of God today. So what do we learn? We sing about it. First off, we learn faith is the victory. It's more than just a hymn we sing. It's the very essence of who we are if we are faithful children of God. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, that beautiful list in the hall of faith. Why? Why were they faithful? Because they understood faith is the victory. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without it, you can't please God. That's, that's pretty direct, isn't it? 
1 John 5 and verse, the latter part of verse 4 says, And this is a victory that overcometh the world, our faith. You see, either the world's going to overcome us or we're going to overcome the world. There's only two options available to all of us. That's what I've said before about the book of Revelation. It's about you and I overcoming the world or the world overcoming us. And the world is overcoming a lot of folks today. You know why? Because they don't believe faith is the victory. They don't believe Jesus Christ is the answer. You want to stop the mass shootings? You want to stop the devastation that's going on in our world? This is the answer, but the world doesn't want to hear it. The world wants to blame everything else, but they don't want to blame the real source of the problem, and that is ignoring the will of God. That is not looking to Christ, the peacemaker, the prince of peace, the mighty God. Everything else is at fault, but let's don't go to the real source of the problem. That's what will fix it. Job chapter 19, beginning with verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Does your heart yearn within you to see God? Do you long for that time that you can be face to face with our Savior? Faith is the victory. Hebrews 13, 6, so we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Man's pulling a lot of tricks. Man's doing a lot today. But our Lord says through inspiration, we should boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And if the Lord is our helper, man can do whatever they want to do. He wants to do. But we have God on our side. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. We're saved by faith. Ephesians 2 and verse 8, we know that we're saved by grace, but it is what? Through faith, that gift of God. So many folks stop at the idea of being saved by grace, and they don't finish that verse. Number two, where do we get the faith? Well, it begins by establishing it through the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Job 42, first part of 5 says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Not only do we read about God and we read about these wonderful stories over and over in the scriptures, but we see the evidence of the results of those stories outside of the scriptures. People talk about creation versus evolution. It's easy to see the evidence outside of the scriptures when we talk about creation. Answers that evolution can't answer, but God can. See, Genesis 1.1 starts with a statement of fact. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God doesn't spend a great deal of time trying to prove anything. Yet the earth itself, the anatomy of the human body itself, proves the existence of God. Because with a design, you have to have a designer. And the world and the universe and the human body is so intricately designed that it must have a designer. Marshall Keeble said it would be like having an explosion in a printing factory and Webster's Unabridged Dictionary just popping out. That's the kind of chance we're talking about when we talk about evolution or a, a big bang or an explosion that started everything. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Either you believe that or you don't. And if you believe it, then certainly we need to live. John 20, verse 30 and 31, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. 
But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Psalms 119, verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might uh, not sin against you. We've got to learn to listen to God. God is speaking to us in these words, in this scripture. The problem isn't whether or not God's speaking to us. He's speaking to us. The problem is, are you listening? Are you listening to what he's saying? Because it's not enough just to acknowledge, yep, that's what the Bible says. Because without hearing, there is no victory. Number three, just as it was with Job, don't accuse God of wrongdoing. Don't accuse God of doing things, creating the temptations or doing things against you as it may be. Job 40 verse 8, would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Deuteronomy 32 4, he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteousness and upright is he. Psalms 145 and verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. We've got no right to accuse the potter of how he chooses to shape the clay. We sing about it. We know the Bible speaks of it. He is the potter, and we are the clay. And he molds us, and he's going to make us to where we are, what we need to be in order to get from this life to the next safely. And here are those beautiful words in the scriptures. Number four, we've got to recognize at all times, God is in control. Don't ever doubt it. Don't ever second guess it. God is in control. Even when things are at their worst, when things seem to be going in the opposite direction of what we think they should go, God is in control. God has used some pretty despicable folks over the time, over history. But even with those despicable individuals, God has still always been in control. And he always will be. God talks with Job about his suffering. He doesn't necessarily give the direct answers maybe that Job would like or maybe that we would like as to why, why is it that good people suffer? Nothing about I love you. God doesn't explain why this happened. God's focus is on power and control. He created all these things. And he reminds Job, do you know the secrets of the universe? Did I call on you to help me raise the sun and set the sun? Not Job. Only God. Job didn't do any of these things. Job didn't know about all these things. The only way he could know about any of this is because of God. Why? Because God's in control. He created it. Who knows it better? That's why John 1, 1 talks about that logos, that living word, Christ, in the beginning was the word. That was Jesus. Part of that creative agency that we see creating the heavens and the earth. That was Christ. That was God. That was the Holy Spirit. That was the Godhead. Because the plurality of God is spoken of in chapter 1. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all working together. Because God is in control. So many, when they're suffering, ask why. It's okay to ask why. God, God didn't condemn or, or scold Job for asking what's going on. Why is this happening to me? It's okay. Because sometimes it's perplexing. But the problem is that when bad things happen, we say, Lord, why me? But what about all the good things that happen? Do we find ourselves at that point in time going, well, why me? Why am I so blessed? Why am I done so wonderfully? Why me, Lord? No. But generally, it's when those bad things happen that the why me comes up. Again, it's okay to ask. But you might not get the clearest logical answer that you'd like to have. 
Job asks some questions that we don't necessarily get the clearest answer from God, but he gives us the answer. We just may not fully understand it or like the answer that we get. Oftentimes that happens. Folks will ask a question and we give them the answer, but they don't like the answer that we give them. That doesn't mean that the question wasn't answered. I think God is very clear with all of us that we've got to be careful not to get too comfortable in this world we're living in because we ain't going to be here long. And we better put our priorities where we are going to be for a while, for eternity. And that's in the things above, not on the things of the earth. When people are suffering, we've got to remind them of the fact that God's in control. They may not even want to hear it, and they may not even acknowledge it at the time. But we need to remind them God's in control and it's going to be all right. Number five, all suffering is not punitive. There were those in Bible times that would ask the question, who sinned? Because of the person that was afflicted, was blind, was lame, whatever it might be. Who sinned? Was it the parent? Was it the father? Was it the mother? Was it them? Who sinned? Because there were times when, and even today, folks look at this suffering as being punitive. But that's not always the case. It may very well be, but it's not always the case. Job obviously didn't suffer because he was bad or he did immoral things and he was being punished. That's what his three so-called friends told him. Three friends that if they would have done what they did at the beginning of the book of Job, and that is kept their mouth shut, the book of Job would have been a lot shorter. But instead, they continually railed on him and told him he was going through what he was going through because he had sinned. And it must be an awful sin that you have committed to have the sores from head to toe. It must be an awful sin that you have done. If you just repent of that, then all of these things will be lifted from you. Job knew better. John 9, 1 and 2. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Somebody must have sinned. Somebody did something wrong. Otherwise, he would have been born blind. John 9 and verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Again, we may not fully understand the answer. Oftentimes we may not understand the answer because we don't really get the question. But we do know from this that neither the man nor his parents sinned. That things are set in motion and certain things are going to happen and there are going to be those that are afflicted. There's going to be those that are blind and lame. There are going to be those that suffer in this life. But they don't have to suffer in the next. That's what happened with the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Abraham reminded the rich man, listen, in life you had it all and Job suffered. Now the roles are reversed. As I mentioned last Wednesday morning, if I've got to pick which role I want, I want Lazarus' role. If I've got to pick either having it in this life or having it in the next life, being rich, we better go with the next life. Because that's the one that's really going to count it. Some suffering might serve to punish. It might. Some, suffer, some should. Some suffering is the result of the sin of others. The innocent often suffer for the sin of others. We see that on the highway oftentimes with drunk drivers who take out whole families. The family didn't do anything. But there was a sin of someone else that did. And the results is clear. But not all suffering is a form of punishment. Number six, this is sometimes a hard one. We don't know it all. We've all been around those individuals that thought they did, that seemed to believe they did, but they don't. You ever come across someone that says they've got this book completely 100% figured out and they know all of it? Run from them. Run from them. 
because they've either lost their minds or they never had the mind to lose to begin with. But what we need to know when it comes to our salvation and what we need to know to get us through this life on to the next one to hear well done, it's clear, folks. It is the world that's made it cloudy and has kind of tried to fog it up here and there, but it's clear. What we need to do to be saved and what we need to do to stay saved. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us, to our children forever. That we may do all the words of this law. What we need to know, God has made it clear for us to know. Those things that we don't need to know. It's kind of like growing up and when adults would be having conversations and children would come in and I can remember my mom and dad. And I'd say, what are you talking about? And they'd say, this doesn't concern you. This is adult conversation. You need to go play. What we need to know, we are told. What we don't need to know, the Lord said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And that's what we need to understand. We don't know the mind of God. But God sure knows the mind of man. We can't explain our universe, but God sure can. God sure can. Number seven, and we all, all of us in here that are old enough, we know this already. Problems are, problems are going to come. It's not a matter of if. We live long enough, we know they're coming. It's just a matter of when, but they're coming. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will Suffer persecution. Didn't say may. It said will suffer persecution. Acts 14, 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. John 15, 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Some folks think they don't deserve to go through the fiery trial. Why is this happening to me? Look what happened to the Son of the living God. Even when he requested, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. His prayer was not answered in the affirmative. It was not possible. He went through those trials. He went through those tribulations. He went through those temptations. And so must we. The final thing is don't give up. Never give up. James 1, 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season we'll reap if we don't lose heart. How sad it is when there are those that lose heart at the end of their life. In those golden years, they lose heart. Don't give up. 1 Corinthians 15, latter part of verse 2, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And of course, Revelation 2, 10, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Luke 21, 19, by your patience, possess your souls. Never give up. Job is an example of that patience that we see in the scriptures. He waited on the Lord. We've got to wait on the Lord. Even when we fully don't understand what's going on, even when we don't fully comprehend why these things are going on the way they are, we must wait on the Lord and never, never, never give up. So we've discussed eight lessons. I hope these are lessons that we can learn from Job. Suffering is tough. But... It is part of living in the world that we're living. It's part of living in the world that God has created. He never said it would be easy. He just said, whatever you have to go through, get through it, and I promise you, 
It'll be worth it when you get to the other side. Is your faith ready for the trial? If you're not a child of God, your faith is not ready for this trial. But the trial will go on. And you will leave this life ready or not. But if you want to make sure your faith is ready for the trial, become a New Testament child of God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If you're a child of God that's wandered away and lost some of that faith and some of that love that you had, you need to come home. If we can help you in any way, won't you come now while we stand and sing? Sing a sweet joyful pilgrim, nor think the moment's long. My faith is heaven rising with every tuneful song. Lo, on the mount of blessing, the glorious mount I stand.
Our closing song is 559. 559 was in the first verse. After that, we just listen to prayer. Hope everyone has a great afternoon. Hope to come back tonight for our 5 p.m. worship service. 559, first verse. After that, we'll be dismissed. What a song of delight in that city so bright, where we walked in deep heaven's fair dome. How the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home. Father in prayer. Most gracious and kind Father, we truly thank you, Lord, for the day that you have given us. We're thankful for the beauty therein, and we're thankful for our health that we had to live and to enjoy it. We're thankful for this privilege and this opportunity that has been given to us to be able to come out to sing praises unto thee and hear another portion of your word. We're thankful for Dale's ability to be able to teach that word to us so that we can understand it. We pray now, dear Heavenly Father, for all those that are sick, and there are several on our sick list. We pray that you'll be with their, the hands nourishing them and ministering to them that they might return to that much wanted help they so much desire and seek. We pray now, Lord, that you'll forgive us for those shortcomings we have in our life. And we pray that you will continue to go with us, continue to bless us, and continue to watch over us. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.